So I have to start by saying this is a rather ambitious topic to cover in 30 minutes, and I was given the title of From Target to IND and IND to NDA. And what I'd like to do today is really frame the discussion and talk about some uh, aspects of drug discovery and dr drug development that will be very generic. And I don't know, I'm assuming the audience is naive, but it, some of you may know more than others. So I've tried to leave enough time at the end for some questions and um, really stimulate the discussion and feel free to ask anything you want. So let me just start with the agenda today. We'll really be focused on an understanding of what is drug discovery and development. What do we mean by the different aspects? And then I'll talk a little bit about uh, target to IND and what that means, and then focus on IND to NDA. And really, the first part is probably where most of you would spend your time if you're thinking about developing a drug. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, where most of you would spend your time is really thinking about the biology and how does it apply to the disease and how am I going to test it preclinically. And then the next part is really about how we're going to do the clinical testing um, and, and often what's required to get you to that clinical testing. And so what I'll try to do is walk through the different pieces today and try to introduce you to some of the concepts um, and to give you a general understanding. But obviously this is very complex, takes a long time. And I'll end with a quiz, so we'll see how we do. The, and the quiz is not about what you heard, but just to give you some perspective. So what is the di drug discovery and development? So it's really the process by which drugs are discovered, optimized, formulated, tested for safety and efficacy, and registered for commercial sale. So I'm going to walk through what you'll see today in pieces of that um, in a slightly different way. So it starts with discovery, you know, basic science. Um, happens both in academia, industry, in partnerships between academia and industry, and really what the idea is to really understand what it is, is the disease you want to treat, and how can I think about a target, which is the molecular identity of the thing you're drugging. So what are you making a drug against, and how are you going to understand how the biology of that will take you to therapy in a disease? And then there's preclinical development, which we'll get into in a, in a little more detail, which is really sort of standard processes that allow you to enter the clinic, toxicology, formulation, things like that. Once you have the preclinical data, you can file an investigational new drug application to the FDA, and we'll go through the pieces of that, but that is really um, a way to initiate clinical trials. You obviously have clinical development where you assess uh, safety and efficacy in people, and then you file what's called a new drug application in NDA. Um, the FDA then reviews all of the information you've given them, and then, of course, if you are successful and it approved, you launch the drug. But that's not the end. There's also a lot of life cycle management, which includes not just additional indications for your drug, but also you often have obligations to the FDA to do additional testing, um, to, to demonstrate safety, to uh, demonstrate longer, broader populations and longer time in humans. So this comes from the pharma website. Uh, it's really talking about the drug discovery process and really meant to make the point that likelihood of success is incredibly low. Success rates in, industry, in this industry are incredibly low. So a lot of different approaches are being taken to try to understand what are the critical areas where we can make better guesses preclinically so that we can limit the amount of time we spend doing clinical trials and limit the cost and ultimately get to drugs faster, better, cheaper, obviously. And the uh, statistic at the bottom there is that things that enter clinical testing, so that's after you've done all the research, after you've validated, you think the mechanism might be interesting, and you start testing in humans, only 16% of those will ever make the market. That's pretty low. So what is drug discovery? So the goal, obviously, is to get to a compound. It can be a biologic, a protein therapeutic, or it can be a small molecule, a chemical compound, that's capable of modulating the disease. But it has to do so w in such a way, it has to have big enough impact that it has enough efficacy that that's a value to the patient, but it also has to be safe and have minimal side effects. All drugs have side effects. It's just a question of what is the side effect profile. So thinking about the different stages, um, there's target identification and validation, and I'll spend a little bit more time on that because I think that's probably of interest to people who do biological work. Um, lead identification, lead optimization, once you have a candidate drug, how do you turn it into something which looks and feels like a real drug? And then the preclinical and clinical aspects of drug development. So it's important to sort of realize that drug discovery is an iterative process. It's not like you find something today and it's the perfect drug. You need to constantly be tweaking the properties of that drug in new and different ways to best understand 
what is the optimal drug and what is the best place to use that drug in terms of therapeutic indications based on the mechanism that you're trying to treat. And the development process is really the process why, by which you turn that compound into a drug by testing it preclinically and then eventually clinically to enable it to be brought to the market and ultimately, obviously, to treat patients um, and bring value to them. So if I think about the biology piece, I think we, we really like to start with human disease. I think there's a lot of talk about um, basic science and how we will get to drug targets, and we will get there by understanding biology in different aspects in different ways. But we, in industry, we really have to understand how that plays out in disease. So it's better to work rather than say, I have an animal model of disease and I study that and I know everything that happens in that animal model. The key question is, is that what happens in that animal model relevant to the human? And never is an animal model going to be exactly like a human. It's going to be aspects of that animal model, mechanisms of that model, pieces of that model that will be relevant for humans. And understanding which pieces translate and which pieces don't are extremely important. But if you think about disease as a continuum, it's everything from health to disease. And you can think about drugs that do different things, right? So some drugs, like vaccines, will prevent the disease in the first place. So are you thinking about a strategy that says, I know what my disease is, and if I give the vaccine first, I'll pre prevent people from getting that disease in the first place. The second, the opposite end of the spectrum is, I don't do anything to the disease but I help the persons with their symptoms. So uh, painkillers or anti-inflammatory drugs that maybe decrease pain or palliate things, but don't really address the central mechanism of the disease. And the middle is where most drugs target, which is they stop or slow progression. Ideally, they reverse progression. So in some cases, like antibiotics, you actually cure the disease the person has. In other cases, you slow the process. So for example, if you lower cholesterol, you lower the risk of cardiovascular disease, but you don't eliminate it. So how do we go from thinking about the disease to a drug? So if you think about diseases, they have a whole range of things that cause diseases, and there are a whole range of contributing factors, everything from environmental to genetic. So if you think about some diseases, and sickle cell anemia as an example here, it's a purely genetic disease. If you have the mutation, you get the disease. There are other things like listed here, a meteor strike. If, you, if that happens, that's purely environmental. There's nothing you can do about that. But there are things in the middle that have both environmental factors and um, genetic factors, like asthma. People are genetically predisposed to asthma, but often a trigger like pollen or something else may make your asthma worse or make your symptoms worse. So thinking about that may contribute to which of the mechanisms may be the most important mechanisms that will address your, address your underlying disease. So if you know the genetic mutation, for example, you have hemophilia and you don't have a, fact, a clotting factor, and you can give that factor, you can directly address the disease in a very clear way. Most diseases are multigenic, most diseases are much more complex, and even when you identify multiple factors, you have to figure out which ones are the most important in those diseases. So thinking about that is really important. So what makes a good target? Well, you have to understand that there's a difference between target ID and target validation. So identification is finding that association between the gene expression pattern you see or the mouse knockout or whatever biology you see that tells you there's an association of your disease and the biological target that you're studying. Um, but the process of validation really helps you understand the functional consequence. So if I knock out that gene, what happens? Or I knock it down in cells, what happens? So get, or I have an antibody and I use that antibody in vivo. So getting an understanding of the functional consequences. So combining those things are really important, but most important is the link of the central mechanism that you're thinking about targeting to the disease you're interested in. And showing, in fact, that the biological evidence you accumulate with your functional data is translatable from your mouse system or your rat system or your in vitro system to a human. The other thing people often don't consider is they focus on the efficacy. So while knocking out um, your entire immune system may be great for autoimmune disease, you're probably going to get some infections. So thinking about the safety consequences of, of drugging that gene are also really important. And what is the risk, the safety efficacy balance that you're going to get? You need to think about technical feasibility. So there may be great targets, but we don't know how to drug them. 
Um, and that's really important as well. And lastly is something I think is extremely important but much more difficult to quantitate is clinical differentiation. So you may have a mechanism which you think works great in your arthritis model and may be really important in arthritis, but you know what? There's 10 other drugs that have very similar profile to that. So how are you going to offer some value to patients that's better than what's already there? So just to make the point about biologics versus small molecules. I think it's important to consider the fact that they have, you, when you think about your target, you may want to drug it with an antibody or you may want to drug it with a chemistry approach. And they have very different advantages and disadvantages. So from a biologics perspective, generally the biggest disadvantage is it's always an injectable. So you have to think about in your indication, are you willing to give an injectable drug? Um, small molecules are generally oral. They can be injectable if there's a reason. Um, Obviously, biologics do not penetrate the cell, so you need to target things which are either secreted proteins or receptors on the outside of the cell, whereas um, small molecules really target things that have a pocket that binds the drug. So that's enzymes, GPCRs, things like that. Um, and with, with antibodies, because they have a unique specificity, you're really testing a specific mechanism when you go in with that antibody generally, whereas with a small molecule, you often have an off-target profile you're not even aware of, sometimes contributing to the disease efficacy that you're seeing. So for example, Gleevec was originally targeted for a specific genetic mutation um, in, a can in a specific cancer, but it turns out that it hits other kinases as well, so it's now expanded the treatment into other populations as well. Um, antibodies are much more straightforward. They tend to have shorter timelines and very, in the preclinical process, be very straightforward, whereas Chemistry is very iterative. You often fail for safety preclinically. So the differences in terms of how long it takes and the complexity of what you need in terms of um, expertise to get you there are quite different. Um, so just thinking about once you have your target, what do you need to do to get your target to um, a lead? You need to have robust assays that allow you to screen multiple compounds. You need to be able to identify your candidates, whether they're small molecules or antibodies, and profile them in these assays. You need to show that they're potent, they're selective against things you don't want to hit, they reduce, they limit the toxicity that you've seen, and you really would like to identify an in vivo efficacy in a disease-relevant model. And as I said, with animal models, you really need to think carefully about whether the mechanism you're testing in the model you're testing is relevant in the human. So if you then have a candidate, you then need to think about what you need to do preclinically before you can get into humans. And that's really about safety testing primarily in animals. Um, this is required by the FDA. There's a lot of discussion about you know, using alternative methods to uh, test for safety. And certainly we, as well as many other companies, do that wherever we can. But it is a requirement for animal testing before going into humans in general. Um, uh, you need a manufacturing method. This is critical in terms to get an efficient, reproducible method. You need a formulation. Is it a liquid? Is it, is, is it going to be a tablet? Is it going to be a capsule? Um, you need to have a method for measuring the drug in the human because you have to be able to say that the dose you gave resulted in a certain level of exposure to the human. And that needs to be consistent with the safety studies where you looked at where you see toxicities. There are many different um, expertises required that go into this. Um, and it's much more complicated than it, it's listed here, but you need regulatory people, you need process development, you need analytical sciences, you need quality assurance to make sure that the drug is done in an environment where it's then given to people, uh, toxicology, et cetera. So um, what is an IND and um, wh what, it, what does it really mean? So the way it works is an investigational new drug application is really actually um, allows the transport of the drug across states. Most people don't know that. It's not really an application to put it into people. And the way it works is you submit to the FDA um, and they have to say no to you for you to stop. It's not an approval process like it is for registration. So when you open an IND, you can conduct cl uh, clinical trials of the investigational product in the US. And you're required by the FDA to closely monitor the safety and report any issues or um, any effects that you see to the FDA. Um, so the IND has to contain information in three broad areas. And I won't go through the verbiage on this slide, but this is actually copied off FDA.gov in terms of what's required for an IND. And it's really three broad things. One is animal pharmacology and toxico toxicology studies. So is your drug efficacious and is it safe? 
predicted to be based on your animal studies. Manufacturing inf information is extremely critical. Do you have a reproducible process? Do you know what the side effects are, not just of the drug, but any impurities in your drug manufacturing? Any uh, formulation, things that you put when you formulate the drug, maybe that haven't been tested in humans before, would be critical as well. And, and also, what is your clinical protocol? How are you going to go about testing this in patients? And are you going to use healthy, normal volunteers? Are you going to use patients? How many of them? Um, what do you expect to see? And then there's something called the IB, which is the investigator's brochure, which is something you need to give the clinician, which tells you everything there is to know about this drug and its testing so far, so that that clinician who gives that drug to that patient fully understands what they're doing. Um, obviously, an important point also is informed consent. The patient needs to be able to understand the drug that they're getting, the potential risks that it's not been studied or has been studied in humans before, and any information that's available. And that, obviously, that consent form is also part of the IND. So as I said, when you submit the IND, um, you have a 30-day review period. Um, the trial begins unless the FDA comes back and puts you on clinical hold. If they put you on clinical hold, then you then need to address any concerns that they have before you can get a release of the clinical hold. Um, but you do have the opportunity to go to a pre-IND meeting. But generally, they only grant one of these, so you should know what you're asking when you go into that meeting. And what you want in that meeting is to gain agreement with them on your overall strategy. Have the talk studies you've done so far support the clinical studies that you're going to be going into. And you want to address any questions. If you're going into maybe a disease that hasn't been studied very well, would they accept the output? that you're going to get in those studies. So just to give you some perspective on the timelines, and I'll just flip through this really quickly, just to make the point that this is a long process. And you're going to see the numbers here are probably higher than you've seen in some, uh, in some publications, and it's all in how you count what's discovery. So maybe you work on a target for five years, and then industry starts tomorrow, says, you've got the most important data. We make an antibody. Maybe we worked on it for six months. Maybe you worked on it for five years. So it's a question of what you count. Um, during that phase, you're going to start making the drug. You're going to do one to three years of preclinical testing, depending on what you, need to go, what you need to do, what indication you're going into, how hard it is to make the drug. Um, you're going to do clinical trials, which can be long or short. And I'll walk through that in a few minutes. And then you need to submit to the FDA, and then they have a review period, which can be quite lengthy as well. And then you launch your drug. So it's not a simple or short process. Um, what are the phases of clinical trials? I think this is an important perspective to have as you think about ideas that you might want to think about making into drugs. So the first phase one trial is generally um, often healthy normal volunteers, but can be patients, especially for biologics. And the reason for going into healthy normal volunteers is usually, especially for small molecules, um, there is less variability in the drugs that you see and less variability in the side effect profile because these are healthy people and you're really looking for big effects. Um, you generally go into a small number of patients or, or volunteers at this stage. Your really primary goal is to test safety and to understand what might be a dose range that's impacting your target and identify any potential side effects that you need to look more carefully at. In phase two trials, you want to broaden the number of people that see your drug, and you want to broaden the amount of time that the patients um, have exposure to your drug to really get a better idea of safety and efficacy. And then in phase three, you really want to broaden very large. You want to fix your dose, and you want to ask the question, what does efficacy look like what, are there patient subsets within my large trial that maybe responded differently? You want to collect as much information as you possibly can. But this is really where you start to see um, side effects that are rare. And in fact, you'll see you know, many drugs have been pulled off the market. If you think about the effect sizes of some of those drugs that have been pulled off the market, they're often pulled off for things that happen in one in 5,000 patients, for example. So as you see, you're often studying only one to 3,000 patients. You may not see those things in your trial. Or maybe you see one, but is it statistically different than zero in your placebo group? Hard to say. So you need to really understand um, what, what, what a broader array of the um, potential side effects at that stage. And fo phase four is really your post-marketing commitments that you have to the FDA. But you also are required to continue tracking. So if a patient calls your company and says, 
I took your drug and this happened, and it's a critical issue, it's something bad, you need to report that to the FDA so that they can be broadly aware of all the things that are happening so they can put together those rare events in a meaningful way. So just thinking about um, this process, as I said, you're really expanding the number of patients and the duration of exposure as you go up, um, as you go through the process. But I just put at the bottom two concepts which you may have heard, proof of mechanism and proof of concept. So proof of mechanism is really a mechanistic study. So for example, if you give a drug that inhibits a particular kinase um, and you take cells out from that patient and you show that the kinase is inhibited, that's a proof of mechanism study. It doesn't tell you anything about the disease. It tells you that your drug has hit the target and that you can now ask the question of whether that target modulates the disease. A proof of concept is something clinical. So a proof of clinical concept means that you measured a clinical endpoint which is relevant to the disease. So it has to be something which is measured in the patient which is not just um, reflective of the mechanism you're testing but actually reflective of the disease. And um, just thinking about the clinical development timelines, it's important to note that different indication areas have different times, and that's largely because you can probably get an answer as to whether your anti-infective works quite quickly, um, but it may take you a much longer time to see if your anti-schizophrenia drug is effective. And that's the nature of the disease, the nature of the target you're impacting, how long will it take to see an effect? Are you looking at something which is preventative or um, only in you know, very sick patients, uh, and what is the variability among those patient populations that allows you to assess. Um, so I wanted to also talk a little bit about personalized medicine or biomarkers, because I think this is really where industry is going, is finding the right pa patient population. And it's really about figuring out who you should study your drug in, because those are the patients that are gonna actually benefit. So thinking carefully about not just um, I'm going to treat everybody who's at risk for cardiovascular disease, but I'm going to treat those people who have had, already had a heart attack and now are at risk for a second one in and they have this mutation in this gene or uh, they have this phenotype. Um, this allows for much faster clinical development. It allows for improved translation from preclinical to clinical testing. So for example, if you know you have a BRAF mutation in melanoma and your drug is against that BRAF mutation, you're only gonna treat the patients that have that mutation. You know in vitro it only hits the BRAF uh, mutation and not the other. You're gonna go to humans, that's gonna be your strategy. It's much faster translation, it's much more relevant, the biology is clear how it links. It allows you to select the right patients. It's more effective. And it allows you to get a better idea of efficacy. The old days of blockbusters, I look at 1,000 patients and I know 100 of those are going to work and that's going to give me some signal and I treat all 1,000. Those days are over. You have much more value if you treat those 100 um, and you know that they will be served by your drug. So that's really where things are moving. So just wanted to spend a moment on biomarkers to think about there are many different types of biomarkers and the words mean different things to different people. But it's really something that you measure, which is an indicator of a biological state. So the biomarkers can exist before the clinical symptoms do. So for example, in Alzheimer's, you can measure imaging modalities that tell you there's brain volume is shrinking before a person has frank uh, memory loss. And so you can start to predict who's going to progress with that disease and start to predict who's going to have the most risk for that. So if you have a drug then maybe going into that population, likely the earlier you go, the more memory loss you could preserve and that's better for the patient. So there's different types and I listed some of the types here and you may hear different names for these, but disease biomarkers. So I'm measuring something about the disease. So for example, if you have a heart attack, you get your troponin levels measured. Those are a diagnostic tool that allows you to say you had a heart attack. It's relevant to the disease. It's a reflection of muscle damage to the heart. Uh, a PD biomarker or a pharmacodynamic biomarker is something you would measure which is related to the drug and the mechanism. So for example, rituximab, which depletes B cells, you can measure a decrease in B cells which says your drug is doing what it's supposed to do. Whether that results in effect on somebody who has a B cell lymphoma, you need to measure in a different way. Um, Predictive biomarkers can, in fact, be used as surrogates, and for many years, for example, cholesterol levels were believed to be good predictors of cardiac events. So you could get a drug registered just by measuring cholesterol. That's unlikely to be the case for the future. 
but um, the idea was that that was such a good predictor that the likelihood is you would impact cardiac events. That would be something you could register the drug, sell the drug, and then come back later and make sure that, in fact, what you thought was true after you market the drug is, in fact, true. And then patient stratification is how you pick based on maybe a, gene based on a genetic mutation or patient subsetting by phenotypes. There can be many different ways to stratify patient populations. So once you've done all this, you know your patient population, you've done your clinical trials, you understand the mechanism, everything's translated, and then you think you have a drug, you then go to the NDA, uh, you go, then go to the FDA with a new drug application or an NDA, and I put this note at the bottom because in biologics they're often referred to as BLAs, which is just a biologics licensing application, which is just the same thing but for a protein therapeutic or a vaccine. Um, the, the, what the, the, the documentation which is required, as it says in this bottom bullet, is basically you should tell the whole story. It's everything from how you understood why the target was a good idea, everything you did preclinically, everything that you understood in patients, everything that's been done with this drug at all, like every piece of data. So you see sometimes it used to be that before people filed electronically, they would send 20, 30 truckloads of data to the FDA. That's what's required to go into these things. Um, now it's all done electronically, but it is an enormous amount of data. Every single experiment that is done that's relevant to whether this drug will be safe or efficacious in humans is sent to the FDA. And the key pieces of what goes into the NDA is really, is it safe and effective? Um, the labeling. The labeling is absolutely key. You are not allowed to advertise for anything you did not demonstrate in a clinical trial. So even if your drug is 10 times better than drug X, if you did not test them side by side in your hands, you cannot state that in your marketing, in your labeling, or in your marketing uh, materials. So you need to be very careful. You can only advertise for what's been done. If an investigator takes your drug and tries it in another indication and publishes that data, um, you cannot sell off that unless you go back and do a real clinical trial. That's really important. Um, and, the, and the other thing is the, meth, the manufacturing is a big deal because you obviously need to have a lot of standards about amount of drug, reproducibility of that amount of drug, the consistency of the purity of that drug. All of that is obviously extremely important. So I just wanted to sort of end with uh, two things, a patient perspective and then I'll come to the quiz which is really about financial perspective. So I think if you're the patient, you don't want to be testing, you don't want to take a drug that isn't going to work for you, right? Because while you take that drug, your disease is marching on. So you really want to not only, not only for um, likelihood of success reasons, you will be much more likely to succeed if you pick the right patient population, but in addition to that, the patients get worse if you treat them with the wrong thing, even if that thing is neutral. So it's really important that we don't do harm to patients and that the patients really benefit from the drugs we give them. So thinking about the right drug to the right patient in the right setting is extremely important. And obviously the earlier intervene will impact the disease in a more promising way. However, you have to understand what proportion of people will be impacted. So for example, if you can measure brain volume shrinkage in 100 people and only 50 will go on to get dementia, do you treat all 100? If your drug is incredibly safe, you may do that, like statins. Many people take statins now because they've been demonstrated to be very safe, but the amount of people that will be, um, actually have cardiac events as a result of their cholesterol are probably pretty small proportion um, in the general population. So in that Alzheimer's example, if you're going to give 100 people your drug, if it has very limited side effects, that may be fine. If it has a very serious side effect, then you really only want to be taking that drug if you know you're going to progress. And if it's only 50-50, you may or may not want to, depending on what that side effect is. So you have to be understanding that risk benefit very carefully. Um, I think it's really important to have the patient in mind. So you need to understand how good will this drug be? Is it efficacious? What will be the potential safety liabilities? And how is it different from the things that exist? Because when physicians prescribe drugs, they prescribe what they know already. They're comfortable, you know, they've been given Embrel for 10 years now, they're comfortable with that. So if you come along with a new one that doesn't do any better than Embrel, why should they switch to yours? That's a risk, a uh, safety risk to them. So, so think carefully about, you know, what value are you bringing for the patient and the physician who's going to prescribe that drug? That's really important, this differentiation piece. So I'm going to end with a quiz. 
How much does it cost to bring a new drug to market? 800 million? Close. Good guesses. One point, it's now the current numbers are approximately 1.2 billion. And as we were discussing earlier, that includes failures. So you'll hear a lot of statistics about what does it cost if I just include the manufacturing of my drug and my clinical studies and that. And it depends on the indication that can be three to 500 million. Um, but, and it depends because if you're in a cardiovascular indication where you have to do an outcome study that takes you five years and you have to study 30,000 patients, it's going to cost a lot more than if you're doing an anti-infective study in patients who have um, an infection. But this is why there's so much focus on the, on the um, costs are going up, success rates are not, which is what's scary, is that if you look at the number of drugs approved over the last 10, 20 years, the numbers are not changing that significantly. The costs are astronomically increasing, and yet the success rates aren't. So we'd like, so more and more um, analyses are being done to how do we increase the success rates um, and bring better value to patients. So of every 10 drugs that actually make the market, so 10 drugs that are approved in the United States, how many of them actually recover the cost that it takes to develop that drug? Two, right, two, two. It's pretty amazing. So even if you get a drug, and even if it works, um, it may cost you more to make that drug and give it to patients than you actually, uh, and spend, than you actually provide uh, value in terms of cost to patients. So, so it's an important perspective. So in the US, what proportion of healthcare costs is attributed to prescription drugs? Come on, you've been close every time. Go for it. So it's interesting. Many people think that you know there's a lot of um, a bashing of the pharma industry because they're so expensive. But if you look at the actual cost of drugs, it's actually 10% of the total cost of healthcare in the United States is prescription drugs. And on top of that, if you actually look at the benefits of prescription drugs, they completely lower the cost. Right? If you keep somebody out of the hospital because you cure their infection, they have a huge impact in terms of um, patients and, and um, medical costs. Very important perspective. And the last one I thought was fun. I heard this and I thought it was surprising to me, so I threw it in there. For every 100 prescriptions that a physician writes, what proportion are filled and taken appropriately? No guesses? 20. Good guess? 20. So it's actually 70% are filled, uh, the, phys the patient takes the prescription and goes to the pharmacy. Of the 70% that get to the pharmacy, only 50% approximately are filled. And of course, this varies by indication and it varies by patients and all that and where you go. But, um, and then there's a proportion of those that actually fill the prescription but take it once and say, oh, it makes me nauseous, I'm not taking it again, or I don't like the side effects, or it didn't do what I wanted it to do so they stopped taking it. So I just threw those out there, not because they really address the topic, but I think they provide a perspective on um, the value of drugs and the importance of really making a commitment to come to more targeted therapies that will probably be l lower cost to develop, will be better overall for patients, and really will provide more value to the industry in a whole. And I just, I don't, I won't go through this. I threw this in there. Um, you'll get the slides, which includes a, a list of some links that give you some of these information uh, from pharma, which is a, a, a body that supports the biotech and pharma industry, as well as FDA and clinical trials um, and other pieces of information. So I'll stop there and take any questions. Yeah, so I, I can't give you the real numbers, but I can tell you what you just said is true. And the main driver is public health care. So in, US, in England, in Germany, in France, public health care, they negotiate price as a government. They pay a lot of money for their insurance. It's public health insurance, and therefore they are large payers with negotiating large prices. Um, the other thing is that companies, uh, countries like England 
have NICE, which is an organization that basically says, we're going to decide if your drug should be marketed in our country. And if you don't offer a big advantage and you're expensive, we're just not going to approve your drug in, to be sold in, in England. Um, you can get it on the private market if you want, but we are not going to do it. So they keep costs down by limiting the number of drugs that are sold in those countries. And, and therefore, you don't have access to everything unless you pay for it privately. But the main driver for cost is really this public negotiation. And that's why there's so much focus on the Medicare costs. Um, because if all health care goes through a public um, uh, negotiation pool, then the cost will go down in the US too. But ultimately, what will happen is there will be less money spent on research because the research is always a proportion of the total uh, profitability of the company. Most companies spend between 15 and 20% of their uh, profits on back into research. So the question is manufacturing, what, how much of that becomes public? So most manufacturing processes are patented, and then the patent's published. So uh, I guess you guys covered patents last time, maybe. <laughs> but basically, when a patent is filed, um, there's a certain period of time where it's private, and then it becomes public information. So usually those methods are patent. Some methods, for example, for biologics, um, some of those are trade secrets, and the companies never publish those. But I would say. Um, you don't necessarily need, for a biologic, you don't necessarily need that method either. As long as you have the sequence of the antibody, you can make it other ways as well. It's not directly comparable, but it depends what your point, what you're trying to do. Say that again? Biosimilars, you're asking about biosimilars. Yeah, so biosimilars, so the issue is that when you manufacture a small molecule, it's very easy to show that the process you've done and everything you've done is exactly equivalent. It's very easy to show they're equivalent. The problem is that for most biologics that are manufactured in animal cells, glycosylation patterns, other sugars, all kinds of different uh, protein modification can happen in those cells. And those um, can be different from cell line to cell line in each company uses different cell lines. So the FDA has, um, there's, been an, there's been a guidance document issued now. And what is required is full clinical testing. So when you make a generic of a, of a, um, of a small molecule, of a pill, all you have to do is show that the, uh, the manufacturing is equivalent. And then you show that the exposure in patients is equivalent. And therefore, you don't have to show a clinical trial showing efficacy and safety. For a biologic, you need to do a full clinical trial showing safety and efficacy with your biologic to show comparability. Therefore, the clinical development costs associated with a biosimilar is very high. And showing their equivalent is very complicated. So for that reason, for antibodies especially, that's very expensive. Where biosimilars are more likely to take off, and the ones that have been approved in Europe so far, are things like insulin, where it's, made in anim where it's not made in animal cells. They're made in bacteria. And so there is no glycosylation to such as show the protein sequence is really the key driver. And therefore, it's easier to show it's equivalent. They're also very short acting, so you can show pretty quickly that they work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what mistakes do biotechs make? So I think the, the biggest mistake I've seen, and I've been in biotech and I've probably made this mistake as well, uh, and maybe you can comment on this when you give your talk as well. Um, I think the biggest mistake is you get very married to your idea. And in a pharma, you have 100 different things. And so if you're working in a big company, you can work on a whole bunch of ideas at the same time. And you can really pick and choose your best ideas. Generally, when you start a biotech, you start off one idea. Maybe you have a couple ideas. But you're focused on those. And if they fall out, you don't have anything else. So you become very married to your idea. You've employed all these people. You really believe in this. You're going forward. But if it isn't a good idea, you're kind of stuck in this place where, to, and if you change and pick a second idea, you may not have the funding to do that second idea. So I think it's really about making good judgment and being willing to let go when it doesn't work. That, that's what I would say. Um, the other thing is it's very hard. Um, I, I think what I tried to impress upon you is it's an extremely complicated, cumbersome process. And if you work in a big company, you have a gazillion experts that do all those different things. 
If you work in a biotech, you're relying on external consultants often, or you're relying on somebody who has to learn something. And because of that, you often make mistakes because you don't have enough knowledge and experience to make the right decision. I think sometimes that works in your favor because sometimes it means you're willing to do something that pharma is too conservative to do. And so I don't think it's necessarily bad, but sometimes it means you make mistakes. So, so you're asking about patient stratification <coughs> via the information that's available. No question, the old days of pharma was, I want to go as many people as I can because I can sell more drugs. That is no longer the case. Those days are gone. It's not good for patients. It's not good for companies. And to be quite frank, there's some really good drugs out there that have failed because they took that strategy. And there really, really is a value if you can find the right patient subset. The question comes down to the cost, right? So if you're developing a drug, if you develop it in that small population, the cost can be contained. If you don't know what the patient population you want to go into is, you need to test in a broad indication. If you, then you spend a lot of money doing a lot of trials, and then you figure it out only works in these three people, you got a problem, right? So it's really about using, as you just pointed out, all the information you have to figure out the right patient subset before you, or when you start. And I think there's more and more and more efforts being put in that space. The other thing I'll throw out there is that rare diseases. So you see a lot of companies looking at rare diseases, which sometimes is patient subsets and sometimes is truly rare diseases. Rare diseases in the old days was genetic mutations. I have hemophilia and I have this factor gone. That's a rare disease. That happens, right? Nowadays, there's subsets of tumor types or whatever that can be characterized by a particular genetic mutation. BRAF and melanoma, or HER2 positive in breast cancer. These things now come with a diagnostic test. You can find the right patient. You can charge more for the drug because it's of higher value to the patient. So you net out the same. And I think for patients, it's better because they know they got a better chance of success if they try the drug that's targeted for their population. So I think the old days of going broadly just don't exist anymore. And, and I think that will not be a successful model in the future at all. Can you talk a little bit about for if you're a startup and you're you've done enough studies where you feel confident and ready to really start thinking about IND and pre-IND and you're looking to hire uh, an expert to help you structure your pre-IND talks? What should you look for in an expert and where do people find these experts? Oh, that's a really good question. So I can tell you, I took a course when I was in biotech on how to write an IND, and there are people, there are courses. And in fact, those courses are generally taught by ex-FDA consultants. So those people, in my experience, are really good because they know what the FDA is looking for. They know how to write one in a way that helps you. Um, and I think that's probably a good way to go. There are several of these company, companies that do kind of educational courses. That would be a great place to start to look for a consultant. I think um, a lot of times there's a lot of private consultants who have lost their jobs in the industry as well. and, and um, and they're out there also. Tom as wants to your point, which is not something I totally agree with, don't worry about hiring a person full time. Hire a consultant because, if you, especially if it's a company, you're getting some different skill sets in there. Yeah. Uh, Tom's point was that, uh, just for the camera, I think Tom's point was that a really good one is that you don't necessarily want to hire one person because there's so much complexity to this. You may need different consultants at different times, and you may need an expert who knows one area at first. And that's really true. You know, you see a toxicology pop up. You don't know how to deal with that. You want to hire somebody who actually understands what happens in that scenario. So that's a really good point. And can you comment sir, at all on the ranges you've seen for how much these consultants cost? Just I can't. People? I, I really don't know. It's very variable, and it depends what work you want done and what you want them to do, how much expertise you have. You know, uh, it's very variable. But I, I, you work as a consultant, so maybe you can address that better than I can. It's no, hard. I, I think it's really hard. I can't. 
yeah, yeah. it's yeah. very and hard. So yeah, the variables are all over the place, as you said. Yeah. Um, you know, I was wondering if you can address the another bygone era, the Me Too era, yeah. which was my <laughs> days in far, big pharma, where you know, and the view of the FDA KOL panels on that now, and how they're reviewing. Yeah, I think um, the days of Me Too's are also gone. I think um, it, it's no longer acceptable to have a drug with equal with equal efficacy, equal safety, and no advantage. Because as I said, physicians, first of all, don't want to prescribe it because they want to see an advantage. But it used to be you could still get that approved, and it would all be about how well you marketed. And I think actually in the old days, especially for small molecules, um, you know, the chemist could make a better compound. The question is, is it big enough differential to add value for patients? And nowadays, especially in other countries, like I said about NICE, um, you have to show a clinical advantage. Otherwise, it may not get approved. And I think very, you know, the, the, so I don't think any, any company has a strategy now where they say, okay, this target's now been validated in humans, so I'm gonna make another drug against this target that's similar. I think what's happening now is that many companies get the same information. They all get their targets from the literature. They're all studying the same biology. They all have the genome sequence. They all have lots of similar information. So they all come to the conclusion about the same five targets that will be impactful in this disease, and they all make drugs against it. And then it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a game of how long it takes. In addition to that, off-target profiles are very different for each of these drugs. So how that plays out at that time I think at the time when you're discovering can still shift um, very much from one to the other. But if the drug's on the market and you're coming afterward, it's a tough go unless you have a big advantage. You gotta be best or first. You gotta be best or first. And if you're best, you gotta be way better. It's, yes. It can't just be incremental. It used to be, okay, you know, a little bit better. Nowadays, you know, going from three times a day to once a day is probably a real advantage. But going from twice a day to once a day, depends on the indication, but maybe not, right? So it just yeah. depends. I mean, they're asking us sometimes to do trials against the gold standard. Absolutely. Right. In almost all cases, all clinical trials have a comparator. If, you, if there is an approved drug, mm -hmm. you almost always have to do a trial compared to the gold standard or on top of the gold standard yeah. in which, some cases. Which is recent. Which is probably, yeah, more recent. Right. But it's also about patients. You can't deny a patient a therapy that exists so you want to make sure if you're going to treat with your risky thing that hasn't been proven yet, you either need to go on top of something that already exists or the person has to already have failed that, or there has to be some very strong rationale why that makes sense for that patient. Monotherapies versus? Yeah, most, I think monotherapy, it's a good point, question about monotherapies versus polytherapy. I think most diseases will be served by polytherapy in the future and knowing what combinations work, what mechanisms can be combined, which ones are synergistic or additive is also really important as well. It's a good point. If only it were simple, right? <laughs> So the question is really about cost and can we afford the cost of the drug. I think there's a couple of questions. One is, um, the first question is will insurance pay for it? If insurance will pay for it, and in most of these diseases, because they're high unmet needs, they have a specific drug that should work in that population reasonably likelihood, high likelihood of, set, high likelihood of success it's a value for that patient to take that drug. Therefore, in the United States, most insurance companies will pay that. Um, so if you have insurance, you're good. I think the question comes to if you don't have insurance, right, or we don't come with a plan where everybody in the country has insurance, the insurance companies will be paying for this without having necessarily all the healthy people in their population as well. And so that's gonna be a question of how that plays out. I think right now, though, in the U.S., um, most people either have insurance and would, these drugs would be recoverable by insurance, or many pharmaceutical companies, if you have no insurance and really cannot afford it, the cost will eat the cost of those drugs. So, um, I, in fact, I think believe all companies, or you can go through pharma as well. So I think if you truly have these diseases where there's high benefit to you 
and there's clearly a, a therapy, a targeted therapy that's expensive, I think most of those patients will get those drugs. I think the question around the insurance is how that plays out broadly in the population is still an open question and we'll have to see. We're going to switch from the <clears throat> pharma to devices. And my perspective is completely different uh, than uh, where Gene was coming from. So when, when, I, was, <laughs> when I was first asked to, uh, to do this, and it was, uh, you, you, when you told me it was basic training, uh, I'm a former Marine, so I, I kind of had this sort of reaction to that. Um, but I didn't go there in the putting it together. Um, oh, and here, basic, basic training, uh, entrepreneur, academic, there is a big difference. And you are more than capable of being both. And that's really where I'm going to be coming from. The, the moving from the academic world to getting something done in the device space. Uh, on, it's actually rather straightforward. Good idea to a finance product uh, project, to a product on the market. There's a lot of risk through that, obviously, and something that, as an academic, you might not buy into this, but you have to raise the money. That has to be your attitude. And if that's the case, then you should know how to do it. Um, the people with the money only care about your science in the context of selling it into a defined market. That's not demeaning your science at all. But if you can't articulate what the clinical benefits are and what the financial benefits are, you're just not going to get anywhere. So the, the point in speaking to this now with you and your various stages of your career is to understand it now. If you're working on a device now, think of it in the terms that I'm talking about now. There's not a thing I'm going to tell you that's rocket science. That's your job, okay? It's the, know, and know your audience. Your audience is a guy like me. I'm not going to understand your science the way you do, but you have to help me to understand it. I'll talk later about bring out that big crayon. I've always I've got a number of companies over the years, and many of them are very, very deep scientific. You know, and the guy that invented it is at the top of the pyramid out of Yale. Is because most of my stuff I bring out of Yale. I know it's a second-class school. I accept that. But know your audience, and your audience in this context is a guy like me. Um, and it's, it's important to think that way. All right, you spoke to this at, at the end of the presentation. You, if you can't articulate the market it's going into and how big that market is, then therefore why a guy like me, keep remembering that, he's not a scientist, a guy like me is going to be able to buy into that. That's a starting point. So if you've got some idea for a device and it's going to do next to nothing or it's going to be the same as somebody else's out there, don't waste your time on it. So think that through early on. The, the patient benefits, the hospital system benefits, the healthcare system benefits, you need to be able to articulate. And that is not hard. I'll, I'll speak a little bit about it later, but it's usually rather, rather direct. Well, actually, I'll do it now. You got a market opportunity. You got a number of patients in a pool. Whoa, I don't know how many cases are done. Where am I supposed to get that information? Doesn't matter. Go to some clinical papers. Go to some studies that were done and get some numbers. Because this, this part is absolutely not a science project. So you get the number of procedures done. And you've probably got a paper or two as references to support that there are 20 billion procedures and you think you're going to sell it for X, so it's number of procedures times X is the market opportunity. So I, I see a lot of people getting, whoa, well, I don't have all that data, and they're spending days, hours, months finding the data. You just simply don't need it. Let them go find the data to refute it and say, okay, it's not three billion, it's one. It's fine, okay? The, from a regulatory point of view, a PMA is, especially in the context of the FDA today, is a very scary thing. The risks associated with that are significant. Everything you were talking about is PMA, and you, you've got this long, drawn-out process. But let me give you a different fact. If it's a PMA in my world, and I'm the CEO, 
and I'm real cocky because I've got 30% of the company and when we sell this thing, boy, I'm going to do really well. By the time you raise all the money you need to raise through the PMA process, your 30% is much smaller. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, sorry. There's a, in the regulatory process, there's a PMA 510K. A 510K means it's equivalent to what's out there. All right, I don't have to, to show safety, I just have to show it's equivalent. And it's, it's, it's theoretically a 90-day process, but with the FDA, it's always something more than that. A PMA is where what you have, there's no predicate. There's nothing that's the same. You know, the materials are different or whatever. So all the studies that you don't normally have to do in devices, in my world, you know, that you do in the drug world, you, that all that comes into play in the context of a PMA. So it's from your point of, now, now if you, on the other hand, and, and this is the point Gene made to me earlier, it's a, a PMA because of the risk and be, you know, and you're doing it because it's a big market. I'm looking right now at an intraocular pressure monitoring system for uh, glaucoma. <clears throat> and this is one of those being willing to walk away stories, okay? I've been working on this thing for about two years and it's just so attractive. But there's so many things that have to be invented to get the antenna small enough to put into the eye, to have the everything about it, the battery associated with it. And we said, you know, because we did Insulet, which is a, an insulin pump, which had this, was a similar sort of thing. And this same team that I have did that. So that's kind of cocky, you know, we can do this. But the more we got into it, the more we realized how much we had to invent and the financial, financial market, the people that give you money, have really lost in the appetite for those kind of projects. I couldn't have gotten Insulet off the ground today. In, and Insulet is a disposable programmable insulin pump went public in 96 and it's doing great things. But the, the market is different, it's harder. Okay. The, my, the main point for me on the regulatory process, you don't have to become an expert. You want to know a little bit more than PMA versus 510K, but you're going to hire experts. You're going to find that consultant, and that's who's going to do it. So you need to understand it. And let's get to where you are today. You're looking at a device. You want to know if it's a PMA, if it's a 510K. You want to be able to say it with some level of confidence, and usually you can do that fairly readily. Do that now. If it, you're looking at it and it's a PMA, your thinking should change. Not don't do it, but your thinking should change and ponder that one. But you don't, at the same time, have to become a regulatory expert. You might want to mention if you're a device and a drug combined, mm -hmm. you're probably a PMA or if there's not a set of regulatory Yes, if, you, if you're, and I'm not qualified to go into any depth on that, okay. um, but we did that with Insulet. But I guess a case in point, I was a CEO, yet I'm not a legitimate expert on that. But insulin, did not require approval. Using it in the device, yes, you had to demonstrate um, all the safety and efficacy. Thank you, very good point. IP, um, if you have an idea, patents, intellectual property, you have an idea and you want to move forward with it and it's kind of it's starting to mature, you got some drawings of what it might look like and you've, you've, you believe it's got a market opportunity, et cetera, Go to your tech transfer office and file a provisional patent. That's correct, right? You guys will do that. Okay, now, from there, you've got to take it from there. Now, you've got that, so you've got a date, but then you have to go raise the money, et cetera, et cetera, and then the rest of the work that has to be done IP is you and your company. The university would not be paying for that, but I'm not going to get into that now. So. In the context of IP for your particular device, you do not have to become an IP expert. You just don't. And the problem with, with guys that, you know, folks that are sitting here, you're all so darn smart, you're in this great school, and by God, you want to become an expert in every aspect of it, you're wasting your time. You want to know enough about it to get it done, hire the consultant or a firm of consultants that can take little bits of this and you know you're getting it done properly. All right, don't dismiss them, it's important. Okay, 
I'm, the reason I'm spending time, I'm coming back to this again, this market, this, uh, market opportunity, is people, what I was saying earlier, they get all hung up. I don't have the data. And, you know, the science in your world, the data matters. Not necessarily in the device world when you're selling. That's what you're doing. You're selling. Now, you're selling something that you believe in passionately. You're selling something that their science is there and it, it's real. But you are selling and you don't want to forget it. So this is AOT. This is an orthopedic play. Um, and every CEO, CEO, virtually everyone that I've ever talked to, how big is your market? <laughs> Billion dollars. Every one of them, okay? And guess what? If you say a half a billion dollars, they're still going to cut your numbers in half. So build your case. So in this case, osteochondral defects are common. And I wanted to give them a reason for that. So I go here. I said, these three guys, Curl, Heidel, and Aaron, they, they did all these consecutive cases, and they found out that in the arthroscopic procedures, one after the other, with, with the protocols are similar, that 20% were, uh, this is my, they didn't use these exact words, 20% were relevant to me and my company and my solution. I was a little hurt that they didn't name it. But that 20% times 984,000 is a big market and I've got data and it matters because there is no other data on osteochondral defects in any way relevant, believe it or not, but you can spend six months looking for that, but it's not there. So, it, and it's the unmet clinical need that we sought out, which we found in the papers, and the same thing, you know, applies to the ankle. Cardiophotonics is a little different. It's a diagnostic. This is the one where we separated the venous and the arterial, and it's, it's, it's a blockbuster product. It's gonna be big. And in this one, I did a little differently because the, the, the uh, audience was a little bit more scientifically uh, oriented. So I, I gave it to them this way. But then I did the same thing. Turned around and told them it was a $1.5 billion market. Guess what? Just for mechanically ventilated. And we've got spontaneous breathing that's five times bigger. And I'm, uh, you, know, you, you, you allow your enthusiasm to come out and be able to defend the numbers, and I can. So if somebody that, remember, you're talking to a, a guy like me, sorry, and you tell me that, I'm a, I'll bet it's half of that. Okay, that's perfectly fine. It's a big market. Remember, you're trying to get them interested to sell them. This is one of the most scientific, scientifically based products I've ever been involved with. I didn't do the deal though. This is just page after page of their PowerPoint present of presentation of that gobbledygook. If you're in that space, you may know something about it. Believe it or not, they never, never once stopped and said the market is this and this and times this amount of money. It was just a, a science project. So. Be proud of your science, but don't get all caught up in it because you've got to convince, and this is probably the best takeaway, a guy like me. It's a guy like me who doesn't understand your science. I have to struggle a bit, and I always ask for the big crayons, and then I understand it better by the time I'm done. So this, the guy like me, um, I've spoken to it enough. Um, when you're talking to me, you give me enough of the science at a high level that I'm kind of going like this, okay? And then you translate my nodding head into therefore the patient benefits. And, and that's fine. If you have somebody that's got, that can go deep in the science, you're gonna have people with you that can go deep in the science if you can't go yourself. You could, I couldn't. Well, I can go fairly deep. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. But Build on it. You don't have to give them a master's, uh, a, a master's program on whatever it is you're doing. Just enough that they're nodding their head, and you're listening carefully to what they do not understand, and then you're going to feed that to them as you go forward in the context of what you need in order to be successful. Um, and again, um, they have to understand what you're saying in the context of a large market. You want to, why am I saying it again? Because you want to say it a lot of times. You're selling. 
you're getting, you're, you're going from academic to entrepreneur. You're still the same person. There's nothing wrong with selling what you believe in and saying it with passion, and you've got to do that. Um, uh, this is we've talked about multiple times. The science is, to, is a means to an end. It's not the end in itself. Remember that. Remember that. Your science got to be good. It can't be baloney because it will catch up to you, maybe not in the first week. I can go, I can, you know, I'm a great salesman, you know, I can get anything happen out of that first product. But if I've been um, telling things that weren't true, I was going to say bullshitting, but you're not supposed to do that here, right? All right. It's okay. It's okay, all right, good, all right, I'll say that. So you can't bullshit, you can't, it doesn't work. It will work first time, I can get by because I'm older, people give me credit for things I don't deserve, right? It's the truth, but eventually it catches up. So, and you have one main thing to sell, integrity. I, I'm, a, I'm a fanatic about that. Um, so in helping them understand your market, again, I will say to you, it does, don't worry about being perfect. Know what you know and say it with passion. Uh, I spoke to the thought leaders and peers. I, I can't overstate that. And you've got access to them here. And that can be a form of mentor to different, you know, where you did your, uh, you know, undergrad or whatever. F have those people. Leverage that. Sometimes they even have money. That doesn't hurt. Uh, the IP, I spoke to filing a provisional to tech transfer office and uh, the regulatory 510K is easier to sell than a PMA. So at the end of the day, it's much less, the, the rigor versus pharma is very, very different. Okay, does that mean you, you oh, oh, I want something. No, the, the, a, a device is an easy thing to get going. You get it with a 510K, I'm doing AOT, doesn't even need a 510K. Doesn't even need a 510K. I, I was offered $5 million three months in, so I turned it down. I'm sort of not sure I did the right thing, but uh, I did because I just really believe that we're going to solve a very big problem. And if you think you're going to solve a very big problem, you really, with a device, you're going to kind of know it now, all right, as opposed to pharma. The device you know. Do that bit of work up front and then go for it. So my passionate comment is, Stay humble, passion about your science, that's fine, but stay humble and recognize that you're selling to a guy like me, half as smart as you are, maybe more years. I know more about my device and you know, my world perhaps than you do. But when you're telling me something, you know more about it than I do. So don't, let, don't make me feel stupid, you know, don't do that, but get to me. Get the facts, get me excited, and do that with passion. Amen. Thanks for your time. Yes, sir. What's the situation in growing interest in marketing directly to the public? Um, it's really equivalent of over-the-counter devices, or tests in particular, you know, 23 and me, chromosome tests. There's now one healing your leg. You know, all the scientists say, ah, what does that mean? But at the end, the, the market is the top. What would cost? What do you think? What, what is the situation? Okay, 99% of the people in front of the room would go, well, and they wouldn't say, I don't know. I don't have a clue. I really don't. Anything I'd said would be baloney. Um, I would have no more information on that than you do. How's that? But as a business person, you would probably agree that uh, something you could directly market to the public without regulation is way better than something that has a niche and an indication and a lot of regulatory concerns. I guess unless regulation was a potential threat in the future after you've already invested in it. While you can sell it. Yeah. <laughs> and what? While you can sell it. While you can sell it. Yeah, there's truth to that, but there are a lot of issues around, you know, distribution and things like that. And are you, yeah, are you better than the other products that are out there? How are you going to get that word out? I don't play in the space. I, I, I like to have enough of the brain power like that's in this room and the science that's behind me and then beat people up with it, you know. All right. And that only works until somebody gets hurt by that thing. Right. Once and then regulated, and then the industry will become regulated, and no one will want to buy it. Yeah. Yeah, isn't that what's happened with all of those metal things that took place? I mean, with well, the ceramic uh, or the ceramic joints, I mean, isn't that, that means they're not regulated, and then. 
Well, they're regulated in that they, they need at least a 510K, but what's the, one of the reasons, this is my opinion, that the FDA has gotten more difficult is because we as um, business people have linked to scientists and really stretch the equivalency argument a, a lot. I mean, to a point, it's ridiculous. Now, when I was at U.S. Surgical and we did it, I was like, you know, that was really good. And we didn't do anything that was bad. We didn't hurt any patients or anything like that. But you can see why the FDA stepped in. Now, they ref we, even for a 510K, there's more clinicals required, et cetera. So <clears throat> I do not appreciate the pain in the neck factor of the FDA, but I respect the people that are there. They've got good intentions. They're not just being difficult. Um, you know, I'm an easygoing guy compared to others. There are some that are out there, Attila the Hun, and they'll, you know, they'll take what this gentleman just asked me and they'll just do what's happening. They'll just go do it. And so you need the, you need the FDA. But if you treat the, you didn't ask me this, but if you treat the FDA respectfully, the individuals respectfully, listen to what they have to say, you'll generally get very good advice. Sometimes they don't want to give you the advice you want. But if they recognize that you're actually going to listen, my experience is they're helpful. They're not, but they're not the bad guys. They're just not. Yes, sir? What proportion of new devices are 5 10? 11%. No, I have no idea. Um, I don't know the number, um, but I would say very comfortably a vast majority are 5 10 Ks. Oh. Um, to get a PMA through, it's, it's not quite as bad as you, but you're talking at least $20, $30 million. Uh, for a 510K, uh, I, I could probably do it for a couple million. But this is the point that Gene, I, I mentioned earlier, that Gene made to me. The, but the PMA, when you get it, you own that market because everybody else that follows you has to do a PMA. The market's bigger. It's wor you know, you made a determine earlier, uh, determination early on that it was worth the risk. But be careful in making that assessment because things change. The gentleman behind you, I had to, yes, sir? I have some strong opinions about what works well for a team in terms of management, for these types of companies. Um, do you think you could comment on that in Yeah. Sure. Uh, in terms of uh, hiring your team, are you are you looking for the PhD pedigree? Uh, do you just take a guy that you know has 20 years experience selling the product? Right. That's essentially what you asked. Depends on their role. I'm sorry. Oh, oh, oh. But, well, I, I look at them all separately. I will, I'll, I'll make the statement that anybody, if you ask the question, would say it's all about the people, so get the right people. But, and find out ahead of time what you need done. You know, for example, when uh, in the conversation earlier, we were talking about the consultant, um, and my reaction was don't hire somebody. You know, uh, use a consultant for a while and see the whites of their eyes. Sometimes you can hire them. During the pro or, or you at least find out what you need. So I don't load myself, I never load my companies up with PhDs. But I'm a device guy. You know, it's very different. It's a, I don't need that level of science. I, might, I certainly need the inventor in the curse of, case of uh, uh, Kirk Shelley from Yale. You know, he's an MD, MBA, PhD, quadruple. I mean, he's got everything. He's like, he's like this like, super brilliant guy. And it's, what's very funny is that super brilliant guy, I'm, I'm, I'm running the meeting and I'm running the company, and it's like, the world's crazy. I can't explain it. It's, but it's all different skill sets. So the sales guy is the sales guy, yes. The R&D guy has to have, you, you, you want him to know a little bit about regulatory, a lot about of IP, and a whole lot about the you know, the mechanics, electrical or mechanical engineering. Am I answering you? So, okay, sorry, I did the best I could. Maybe actually to build on that question, if you want to talk a little bit about what kind of issues you would outsource to a consultant or a part-time person you 
contract to give you advice mm -hmm. versus is an early company the type of person you would need to bring on full time or the type of skills that you would want to make more permanent and start? Okay. Um, I'm going to use applied spine as, thank you. I'm going to use applied spine as an example. Um, I hired a guy, uh, uh, Rensselaer, okay, really, really smart young guy, a lot of experience and a, and a really good mechanical engineer. Um, and he did a great job, but he was, he was young. And I, uh, he definitely suffered from intellectual arrogance, okay, so I had to constantly watch that. So what I would uh, do without offending him, um, I would bring in experts uh, for brainstorming sessions regularly, completely off the wall, Pe you know, find people anywhere and get them in and just sit and have brainstorming sessions. And then he would do what he want. And I did, I, I mean, not do what he want, but he would get that input because there's a lot of materials, questions, you know, there's a lot of thing that's go things going on. But, Applied spine, we, we got in trouble because we had some screws breaking because we had, um, he treated the, the, uh, the screws, but we hadn't peened, uh, uh, grit blasted them, but we hadn't peened them first. I wouldn't know that. He didn't know that. And when it happened, the solution was not apparent to anyone. So you can either go, okay, you know, we don't know, or you, you build a uh, stable of these smart people that you can turn to, and that's what we did. The people that we had, and I was conscious on my part at the time, but I didn't know why I would need them, but I, you know, I wanted people with expertise in what we were doing. So I brought all of those folks in, and we solved the problem readily. However, now I'm gonna relate the story just so you hear it. We did, and I'm to this day very proud of it. The, there aren't any more broken screws, it worked. Finances and regulatory. We were, it's a PMA, we're in the middle of our clinical trial, the screws broke, I stopped the trial, to the, the, the board was very, very unhappy with me, but I'm sorry, that's it. Stopped the trial until we figured it out, but then we figured it out, we go back to the FDA. And the FDA says, okay, now, bear in mind, I'd raised $45 million. We had, you know, we were well funded. But they said you can do two patients, two patients, wait six months, do two more, wait six months. And I was like, oh my God. So what do you do? You know, you've got an infrastructure, you've got staff. I mean, and you, you, what your, your fixed costs continue. So the money you raised is just, going away and you're not moving any further. You're not hitting the milestones that you expected to hit when you raised the money to begin with. So it all comes together. Um, but it, it's, it, and it does, it all, God bless you. But it's not, at the same time, it's not rocket science. Hell, I figured it out, okay? But it's, it starts with you, your passion on what, you're, on your, what you think you have, and then you do this homework up front and you'll probably do it twice. If you're good at it, maybe you're gonna do it three times. This is the last thing I'll say unless there's another question. And the people that you're gonna to go to to raise the money, to, 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 all of that, are gonna be out there. So do a good job the first time. How many chances do you have to make a first impression? One. And the financial world is very small. So do your first one as though it's your, only your first and you're gonna do more and treat the people that way uh, in order to be able to go back to them because they respect you for your respect of them. <laughs> I don't know. Are there any other questions? Yes, sir. Can you give me one I can answer? The advantages and disadvantages of setting up your own company to, to develop a device you have versus selling it to a bigger group of... I have a lot of experience there. Um, I, what I'm doing now is I'm bringing devices out of Yale, and I call it, I have a bunch of gray hairs like me, you know, but one, one is a, an IP guy, the other is a pure deal guy, another finance guy. And I, I've been using uh, virtual teams to do that. <sighs> um, and I forget the rest of your question. Oh, oh, oh. 
they said they will close it down. I didn't remember it because I didn't remember it because of the pain of doing it. <laughs> when you, if you in the in the, in the device world, um, the the standard um, general thinking is that you're not going to bring it to the J and J's of the world until you've got some sales and you've taken all the risk out and then they'll pay you a multiple of sales. They know you're going to pay you more. AOT, okay. I deliberately did that in such a way um, because I, could, I wanted to go against that thinking and that's the five million dollars that I turned down and now I'm trying to raise money again so I'm wondering how smart that was but I won't know that for another year or so. Um, but it's not reasonable to think you're just getting a little bit done and sell it to somebody. It's not. They're not going to give you any. They won't even listen to you. They really won't even listen to you. Now, they're listening to me because I started with it so early, and now I'm talking to them again. It's further along. But no, I don't advocate that. What they don't want is risk. They want something in their bottom line. They don't, want, they don't want to pick up all the, the R&D costs, which all affects their profitability. They just want to buy it when it's ready. But I'm saying it definitively, yet living a different life still. So, But I'm a little nuts, so I'd be careful of that. Yes, ma'am. Um, the question was, how do you raise money? Do you go to companies, and how do you get it? It, it's, it, they're all different, and I'll tell you now, a, a good way to do it in the beginning is government money, you know, and you, you all know you go out and get your grant. Um, then another interim place is the angel world, and there are angels groups, you can find them, and I, I haven't done much with angels. I have, in my omniscience, decided that that's not a good idea, but I'm wrong. But I haven't, at any rate, really nurtured that world. The, the, my money, I generally get from VCs. Um, and then, this is in general terms, it's helpful to have this information. There are lots of different kinds of VCs. I just told you there's angels. And there's lots of different kinds of angels. But I, I'm not really, I don't spend enough time in that world to babble at it. I, I spent enough time in the VC world to babble at it. And I'm a partner in one, okay? Um, some of them are will do small, you know, startup, the seed companies, and most of them, those that you've heard of, are, you know, if they're not putting 20 million in, they're not interested, and you just want to know what the difference is. And in that case, find a guy like me. But I, I, I take that back because most of the guys that are going to go help you raise money, uh, don't do it. Do it yourself. So. It's with it's but it's all people. Yes, sir. But is there venture capital groups don't invest in most of them don't invest in free revenue stage. They want to see some revenue before money. Well, that's what I know from I have experience from angel groups where in certain angel groups they want to see a product they want to see something that works. The idea on the table is not really they say oh interesting show me something that works that's something and then I'll think about it. I think that's my my little experience in this world. But I th you know venture capital groups that actually would be willing to go in a pre-revenue stage? Yes, many, many. But then it's a matter of how early are you? Well, we invest early. Well, define early. So, and, and, and I, I keep coming back to relationships, which is why I mentioned you might have two or three of these that you're gonna do. So start to build the relationships, treat them the way you wanna be treated and learn which ones do what. And then once you, once you I'm, I'm, I've become an expert at networking. So you know this guy who gets you to this gal who gets you to, and, and just apply that here. Okay. Um, no, no, I have another 45 minutes. <laughs>